Discover your spiritual identity with Bible teacher and best-selling author, Mike Shreve. There are hundreds of names and titles God has given His people that reveal who you are in Christ. Knowing these biblical names empowers you to claim your God-given inheritance and fulfill your purpose in this world. Get ready for a spiritual awakening that will cause you to boldly declare, I am who God says I am. Now, here's Mike Shreve. The name for God's people that we're going to bring forth on this program is absolutely amazing. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 10, verse 25. Read it carefully. As the whirlwind passes, so is the wicked no more, but the righteous is an everlasting foundation. That's the King James Version of Proverbs chapter 10, verse 25. As the whirlwind passes, so is the wicked no more. What does that mean? Well, have you ever seen a tornado or been in an area where a tornado struck? The only way you can tell it ever existed, it appears, then it disappears, but it leaves destruction in its wake. And the same thing is true with regard to a wicked person. The only way you can ever tell that person came into the world and then left the world is the destruction left behind. But the righteous is an everlasting foundation. Instead of temporary destruction, it's eternal relevance that is produced in the life of a righteous person. Not only is it eternal in scope, it's a foundation that God can build on and a foundation that others can build on. A righteous mother and father, for instance, is a foundation that children can build their future on. They can look at you if you've provided a Christian example of the way to live with moral parameters in your life and godly behavior and biblical principles, and they build on the foundation of the faith walk that you set in front of them by your example. And in like manner, you do it not only for your children, but for anyone and everyone you come in contact with through life. You become an everlasting foundation, a foundation that produces something in their lives that has an attachment to everlasting life. Now, the reason that we can claim to be an everlasting foundation, though, is the fact that we have an everlasting foundation. The New American Standard Version of the same verse words it a little differently, but I believe the two different versions are complementary. Listen to the New American Standard way of saying it. When the whirlwind passes, the wicked is no more, but the righteous has an everlasting foundation. Now I see it from a completely different angle. When the whirlwind passes, in other words, the trials, the tribulations, the struggles of life, temptations, hardships, disappointments, and failures, the whirlwind passes through your life. Well, a wicked person has no defense. A wicked person has no place of uh, safety. But a child of God who is walking in righteousness, they have an everlasting foundation. The foundation underneath them is so stable they can endure the unstable moments of life. And we're going to go into that more as we proceed. But I first want to revert back to the King James Version that says you and I are an everlasting foundation that God himself is building on. God is building his work, the advance of his kingdom, the proclamation of his name, and the outgrowth of his family on you and multiply millions of others like you. And it's not a thing unthinkable because I read in Revelation chapter 21, verse 14, uh, a description of New Jerusalem. And New Jerusalem, of course, is the capital city of a new creation. And many descriptions are given to New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation, but this one is really important in the revelation I'm sharing. It says that the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, those could be consecutive foundations, one built on top of the other, 
or they could be 12 foundation stones laid on one level. Either way, the names of the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles of the Lamb, were inscribed in those foundation stones because everything God would do in the New Covenant era was based on the lives and the message of the 12 apostles. And when I say 12 apostles, of course, Judas was excluded because of betraying the Lord and a 12th was added. I personally believe the one God added was Paul. And he showed an apostleship in his ministry that was quite valuable to the growth of the church. I tend to believe he was the last of all the 12 apostles to be brought into that status. We'll find out when we get to heaven. But see, there's also a time prior to salvation when we don't have such a strong foundation to build our lives on. Neither can people build their lives on us. Job chapter 4, verse 18 and 19 talks about the place of instability we were once in. If God places no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with error, how much more those who live in houses of clay whose foundations are in the dust? Now, some of you listening to me may be builders. You may be very familiar with construction work and how you've got to lay a strong foundation, concrete foundation, because the building is only as strong as the foundation it's placed on. And I'm sure you would never in your wildest dreams ever imagine building a house on a foundation of dust. And yet our bodies came from the dust and the fallen nature that we deal with is in a sense from the dust. And so unsaved, unregenerated people who are not walking in a relationship with God are just as unstable as a house built on a foundation of dust. Dust has no value. Dust has absolutely no value. And the flesh on its own has no value. Let's go to Psalm 82, verse 5. Not only are we in that dilemma, we're in a world that's very unstable. In fact, Psalm 82, verse 5 says, all the foundations of the earth are unstable. And it's talking about the things that people depend on in order to have a, a future that's secure, a life that's predictable, a life that is comfortable, a life that is secure, a life that is calm and peaceful. And they depend on different things to bring that stability into their lives. But all the foundations of the earth are unstable. Without God, None of it is predictably going to be strong and dependable in your life. You need more than what the world can offer. Now, we also know that we are headed to an era of extreme instability in this world. Described by Isaiah 24, verse 18, and the prophet may have been talking literally, and he may have been talking figuratively. But he said, the earth will reel to and fro like a drunkard. The inhabitants of the earth will be burned and few men left, which sounds to me like a global holocaust, maybe a nuclear war. But then in verse 18, it says, for the windows from on high are open and the foundations of the earth are shaken. There's a statement I've heard many prophetic people use that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Let me repeat it again. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. All the things that people think provide stability of life without God being in the equation are going to be shaken and proven to be unstable. Governments of the world, even now, in the last few years, we've seen a destabilization of governments and People have trusted in this political party or that political party, and they become undependable. And, and politics is an area full of deception and duplicity. And the business world, one day it could, be, it could be doing extremely well, and then the next day the stock market just about collapses entirely. It's all unpredictable and it's all unstable. And every part of society that people depend on like 
uh, the food sources and education and other things that provide for a stable life, they're all under attack right now. And, and we need more to prepare us for the future. And I'm telling you the kind of foundation that you can depend on on the rest of this program. Because when the whirlwind passes, the wicked is no more. But the righteous has an everlasting foundation. See, the reason you can be an everlasting foundation is the fact that you have an everlasting foundation. And actually, there are a number of levels to that foundation that is under you. And I'm going to bring out each one of them. And each one is a little bit larger in scope, bigger in size than the previous one. And it provides a foundation that can never be shaken. The Bible said we have received a kingdom which cannot be moved because of the foundations that I'm about to share with you now. Praise God. There's eight foundations. I'm going to enumerate all of them right now, and then we're going to go through the list one by one. Number one, righteous works. Number two, imparted righteousness. Number three, the church as a whole. Number four, the apostles and prophets. Number five, the doctrinal foundation. Number six, God's holy mountains. Number seven, God's foundational plan. And number eight, Jesus, whoever was and ever will be the image of the invisible God. Remember the scripture said the righteous is an everlasting foundation and the new American Standard Version says the righteous has an everlasting foundation. So we've got to start with righteousness. Your first foundation is comprised of all the righteous works that you have performed as a Christian, whether it be going to church, sharing offerings and tithes, with your local church or with missionaries, providing a witness in your community, doing good for the underprivileged, whatever you're involved in. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 18 and 19, that you and I should be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for ourselves a good foundation for the time to come, that we may lay hold on eternal life. Praise God. So first, you have the foundation of our righteous works. And that's a foundation that will endure on into the next age for our good works will live on forever. But the only reason we can do righteous works is the fact that we have received imparted righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made the Son of God on the cross to absorb the sin debt of the entire human race so that we could absorb the righteousness of God. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So when you come to him and hunger after his righteous nature, he fills you with himself. He creates the new man inside of you in holiness and true righteousness. Praise God. That new man is birth righteous, just like you're born in sin through no choice of your own. You're conceived in iniquity through no choice of your own. You don't, you don't become a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. You're born a sinner when you're born naturally. Well, when you're born again, you're born righteous. You don't become righteous because of righteous works. You do righteous works because you're born righteous. Do you see the difference? And that's part of the foundation. That's the second foundation. First, you have our righteous works, but bigger than that is the foundation of God's imparted righteousness. Let's go to the next one. Number three is the church of the living God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul said, In case I'm delayed, I want you to know how people who are members of God's family must live. God's family is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Wow, what a charge that the church as a whole is our support system. 
The church is a pillar and a foundation of the truth in the world. You find the church evidenced on every continent. In every nation, there are true believers born again, blood washed, sons and daughters of the Almighty God who will rally for one another and fight for one another and help one another. See, that's a foundation under you that you can be confident in, that you're part of a group of believers who have a covenant commitment to God and a covenant commitment to you. And most of all, we have a covenant commitment to the truth together. And that's our foundation, the church of the living God. And if you falter and stumble, there should be some compassionate and merciful member of the church that will reach down and pick you back up again. Praise God. We're here to help one another, and we need to be transparent with one another. And when we have a need, voice that need, and someone will be there to meet that need. Now, the next foundation stone is a bit larger than the church. And we find it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. And it's talking about the body of Christ as a temple, the temple of God, being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Look down at the foundation under you and you'll see the testimony of Abraham, who was a prophet of God. The testimony of Moses, who was a prophet of God. The testimony of men like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and all the other testifiers of the Old Testament who prophetically spoke to their generation and beyond. What they said and what they revealed ushered in the next stage of God's redemptive plan and laid a foundation for the coming of the Messiah. And then he chose the apostles in the beginning who proclaimed his message to the far ends of the earth. And so the church that is undergirding each one of us is undergirded itself by the apostles and the prophets that proclaimed the revelation message that God gave them. Praise God. It's going to get even more intense after this. The next is the word of God. The Bible said heaven and earth is going to pass away, but the word of God will never pass away. Think of that. Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The word of God is eternal. And one good place to go to is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. This says, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of the doctrine of baptisms and of eternal judgment and of the resurrection of the dead. And he said, this will we do if God permit. He mentioned just six foundational doctrines there, but there's many more doctrines that provide the foundation of the word of God that we lay in our lives. It's underneath us. It's underneath the apostles and prophets and wider and broader in scope because the word that undergirds us undergirded them when they gave the living word of God to their generations. Praise God. But there's something even more powerful that we need to go to. Psalm 87 verse 1 says, God's foundation, his foundation, is in the holy mountains. What mountains qualify to be holy? What mountains would be sacred in the sight of God? Because true worshipers worship anywhere. We don't have to be on top of some high place. Like idolaters chose to worship on high places or mountainous regions. In the Old Testament especially, you read about that. We don't need that. So what mountains are holy mountains? I believe there are very significant times where God has caused pivotal events to happen in this world that changed the spiritual atmosphere of this world to such degree God caused them to take place on mountains so that the natural was a reflection of the importance of the spiritual event. It was a mountaintop event where heaven came down to earth, 
earthly people were lifted up into a revelation of the nature of God that changed this place, that changed this world, and that changed their lives forever. Let me give you some examples. For instance, what about Mount Ararat? That's where the ark landed. That's where Noah and his family exited the ark, and they offered up a burnt sacrifice to God and saw the rainbow, and God introduced covenant language. He said he would enter into a covenant with Noah and with his offspring. That was so foundational to everything God would do later on. And the rainbow represented not only God's promise that he would never bring a flood on the earth again, but God's promise that he will bring a new dawning of a new day to this world. It's like God saying from the beginning, there's something blessed out ahead of you, and I will keep my promises. So that's a foundation underneath us, Mount Ararat and what God did there and how things were changed. Then you move up in time, and probably the next significant mountain is Mount Moriah, where Abraham took his son Isaac and was about to sacrifice Isaac on an altar, when right at the last minute, God intervened and provided a substitute in death. And of course, that's why Abraham called that place Yahweh Ira, or the traditional sound of the words is Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord our provider, because God provided a substitute in death. And instead of Isaac dying, something died in his stead, which was all a revelation of the plan of God to come. And then Mount Sinai, where God spoke the Ten Commandments, and the declaration of God rolled across the desert plains as God's will for mankind was made known, the moral parameters he expects us to live within. And then the next major mountain was Mount Nebo, where, where Moses received a glimpse of the promised land. And then what about the Mount of Olives, where Jesus prayed in agony of prayer and sweated drops of blood as he yielded to the will of the Father. And then Mount Calvary, known as Golgotha, the place of a skull. I believe it was in the shape of a human skull for a reason, because Jesus was not only crowned with thorns, I believe he was crowned with the mental misery of the whole human race, and he conquered it all so that we could have peace that passes understanding. And then a future mountain is Mount Zion. Mount Zion, where the hub of the government of God will be in the kingdom age to come, where the throne of the Almighty will be erected and peace will come to this planet again. All these mountains are foundation stones under us. Think of it. If you built a house on mountains, would you even worry about it being unstable in a storm? Well, you should never even think of yourself as being unstable because God's foundation in your life are the holy mountains that he has revealed great facets of his plan on. Calvary and the intercession of the Son of God and backing up in time, the promised land that is ahead of all of us, not the promised land that Moses saw, but a promised destiny, a promised outcome from this world that is yet to unfold. All of these are mountains underneath us that are like foundation stones, but there's something even bigger and larger than those mountains. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. This is out of the parable of the sheep and the goats. And now the sheep are being referenced, and the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So he's talking about a foundation plan, a foundational word plan, I call it, that had contained within it our ultimate destiny in heaven. It all happened in the beginning. The Bible said the works were finished from the foundation of the world. The scripture says the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. Our names were written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. And the scripture says you and I were chosen in him, Ephesians 1, 4, before the foundation of the world. There was a foundational word plan 
that God is not going to allow to fail. And you are a part of that plan. Let's go to the ultimate foundation, though. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So that's the primary eternal foundation stone, infinitely long, infinitely wide. It cannot be measured. It's underneath the foundational word plan and all the other foundations I've mentioned is a foundation that is stronger and greater than any battle you will ever face in life. It's the foundational Son of God, Lord of Lords, King of Kings that reigns in your life. He's not going to let you down. Now, can you see why you are an everlasting foundation? Because if all these eight foundations are in your life, you're just as stable as the foundation stones that you are basing your hopes and dreams on. You can look down now and say, I'm unshakable. I'm unconquerable. I'm unbeatable because God's laid these foundation stones in my life and you'll have to defeat them before you defeat me. The foundation stone of the righteousness of God that's imparted the foundation stone of the church underneath me, the foundation stone of the apostles and the prophets, the foundation stone of the eternal word of God and the holy mountains of God and the foundational word plan of God and Jesus himself. You'd have to conquer all of those things before you can conquer a child of God who is trusting in the salvation plan that God has given. Now that you have realized your own stability, it's time for you to become a stable source of strength and joy and peace and love to others so that in a changing world, they know that person never changes. You get around them, they're always happy. You get around them, they're always talking about Jesus. You get around them, they're always uh, upbeat and victorious in the way they present themselves. See, you can be stable in an unstable world. That's part of what God has chosen you for. What a powerful truth, seeing ourselves as God sees us. You can go deeper into this revelation by getting Mike Shreve's book titled, Who Am I? Dynamic Declarations of Who You Are in Christ. We invite you to visit our ministry website, shreveministries.org, and our comparative religion website, thetruelight.net, where you can download a free ebook of Mike Shreve's testimony titled, the Highest Adventure, Encountering God. Check out our publishing website also, deeperrevelationbooks.org. Sign up to receive our emails, subscribe to our podcasts, and join a community of believers who boldly declare, I am who God says I am. I invite you to come and visit my YouTube channel. The address is Mike Shreve Ministries. You'll find the first few categories are involved in bringing forth this revelation of the names and titles of the children of God. Then the next section goes into comparative religion subjects. Finally, there's interviews. There's something that will be a blessing to you. Come and visit us.